ladies and gentlemen when at a meeting of a jodh devs professional education forum and the pk shivdev trust it was decided to recognize the contribution of a young dedicated committed diabetologist the first jpf award the only name that came up spontaneous and unanimous was that of anush maheshwar who is well known for his professional contributions in the science practice and research of diabetes he is an able organizer of various national and international scientific programs and he is also a gifted speaker may i now call upon professor ak das kindly come over to the dais dr anju anuj maheshwari please come to the dais i now request professor ashok kumar das to kindly honor dr anuj maheshwari to adorn him with a silver shawl great pleasure you won't believe me i didn't know that he is the awardee because i came late last night 1 o'clock in the night i was having my breakfast with professor v shesha who was here to give oration yesterday he just looked at me and said ashok anush has made tremendous progress in various fields including diabetes and pregnancy when it comes to person like dr shesha it says let many things he has been in addition to being wonderful researcher investigator teacher communicator he was also the proverbial organizer of the rssd in lucknow and dear friends the way he organized it was exactly it was was exemplary and it has created new bars for others to cross so i am delighted that the first jpf award has gone to anuz and and and, and this is a worthy award to a very worthy son of india and congratulations to uh, dr anish maheshwari he has made phenomenal uh, accomplishments in the science and research of diabetes in india and uh, he is from uh, lucknow and uh, i think uh, all about you already said and we are we are honored to have you here Uh, of course uh, it's not the other way we are highly honored to have you here and uh, we are highly honored to uh, provide you and hand over the first jpf uh, young researcher award to you and he is going to give an oration on a very very important topic and that is liver in diabetes liver in diabetes is gaining momentum from non alcoholic fatty liver disease to steatohepatitis to cirrhosis liver there are more and more liver transplant centers emerging and diabetes per se is now gradually developing as one of the major reasons for the development of liver failure so we have been discussing about vascular complications of diabetes and now this is another complication of diabetes and dr anush maheshwari in his award oration is going to lecture on in depth aspects of liver in diabetes over to our good friend dr anuj thank you uh, dr jyoti dev thank you for the nice introduction thank you professor ak das for the kind words for me i really don't know whether i deserve those words or not but i am really humbled of those words what professor ak das has told about me and i really understand as well as uh, admit this that the jyoti dev has awarded me really from his heart and i acknowledge this very much so not wasting much time i should come over to the uh, exact uh, what has been the task given to me for the day definitely i am thankful to jyoti dev and sunita from the core of my heart and all the people those who have chosen me for this award so before i start my talk i would like to invite you for a world congress of the chrono medicine which is being held in lucknow on 5th and 6th october in association with the indian college of physicians and 
all of you are invited here to be a part of that already related to that a lecture has been given by professor narsing verma in the morning and dr jyoti dev is also and professor ak das is also one of the important part of this congress so please make your date block for this event now so today i shall be speaking on the liver and diabetes in relation to the non alcoholic liver diseases and its progression non alcoholic fatty liver disease is referring to a hepatic steatosis when no other cause is found for that many times what we know that alcohol consumption is one of the bigger reason for the hepatic steatosis once it is not there and despite that patient is developing fatty liver disease it is called as non alcoholic fatty liver disease and it is so fatal to us it may lead to the cirrhosis and it is likely an important cause of the cryptogenic cirrhosis it can be divided into a two categories depending upon the presence of inflammation if it is without inflammation it is called as hepatic steatosis if it is associated with the inflammation it is known as alcoholic steatohepatitis there are some more common terminologies which are used for the non alcoholic steatohepatitis or what we call it non alcoholic fatty liver disease like pseudo alcoholic hepatitis alcohol like hepatitis fatty liver hepatitis steatosis necrosis and diabetic hepatitis as far as the prevalence is concerned it is a worldwide and most common liver disorder especially in the western industrialized countries where the major risk factors for the nafld are central obesity type 2 diabetes dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome are in the us the prevalence is approximately 10 to 46% worldwide prevalence is 6 to 35% but unfortunately in the last few years especially in last 20 30 years india has also witnessed the surge of metabolic diseases especially the diabetes and obesity and with the increase in the number of the diabetes and obesity it has gone increased in india despite it is not so much industrialized as the western countries are but it is having the highest prevalence that is 56.3% and unfortunately this prevalence is highest in the younger generation that is a 25 to 40 years and lowest in the oldest 71 to 84 years of the age group as the time passes the prevalence of nafld non alcoholic liver disease is increasing day by day in the 1988 to 1994 it was 5.5% and in 1999 to 2004 it increased to 9.8% in 2005 to 2008 11% and that prevalence is on that ground when all the people have been included in this category they were found to have increased sgpt level or you can say amino transferase level but you know now we all know that nafld is seen without increased level of the amino transferase too so this is actually not the real picture which has been seen in those past years and as far as the chronic liver disease is concerned in contemporary years it was 47 in the 1988 to 1994 in the 99 to 2004 it was 63% and in 2005 to 2008 was the 75% so this was a big ratio of the chronic liver disease the part of which it has been shared by the nafld was that as we all know the in these time periods the study also noted increase in the rates of other components of the metabolic syndrome these are the two important contributors for this non alcoholic fatty liver disease one is the obesity and another is the diabetes and third is the stomach hypertension and though we all know that insulin resistance plays a key role in the establishment of this non alcoholic fatty liver disease but you can see here in this data that systemic hypertension is the highest number causing nafld in all time periods followed by obesity and then with the diabetes 
the most of the patients are diagnosed with NFLD in their 40s or 50s, but in India they are in the 25 to 40s. The studies vary, vary with regards to the sex distribution, more common in the females as compared to the males. Patients with NAFLD, particularly those who have the state of hepatitis, often have one or more components of the metabolic syndrome like obesity, systemic hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance or over diabetes. The pathogenesis of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has not been fully elucidated. The most widely supported theory implicates insulin resistance. As I already told you, it is supposed to be the key mechanism leading to the fatty liver disease and it is important that it can give rise to steatohepatitis. Others have proposed that it is not only the sole cause. Insulin resistance is not the sole thing which can lead to steatohepatitis. In addition to that, some of the things which can increase oxidative stress, oxidative injury are supposed to be the second hit for the development of steatohepatitis. What are those? Like necroinflammatory components of the steatohepatitis are increased by the liver iron, leptin, antioxidant deficiencies, intestinal bacteria also play an important role as a potential oxidative stressor and not less from any causes the hormones which are derived from adipose tissues play an important role in the causation of NAFLD. So these are the environmental factors for a fatty word what you can say that give rise to the NAFLD. So NAFLD is a disease which is sharing the same causes as well as the same consequences what are seen in the metabolic syndrome. It is triggered by the overeating, physical inactivity as which is arising in the form of the increased waist size and once the person is eating continuously but not expending the energy, that energy is being stored into the form of the adipose tissue. And this increasing adipo adipose mass is responsible for the hypoxia, impaired blood, blood flow and adipocyte cell death which are in association of the ceramides and cytokines as well as in the increased level of the chemokines. All these adipocytes which are dead are surrounded by the macrophages and in that way they are increasing the level of the non-esterified fatty acids while adiponectin is decreased. This non-esterified fatty acids enters into the liver and by the de novo lipogenesis converts into the triglycerides and ultimately it leads to the increased level of the cholesterol, VLDL and uh, damage to the liver cell which is caused by this de novo lipogenesis reflects into the form of increased liver enzymes and by doing that this patient comes up in the form of the fatty liver disease and it is not only witnessed by the increased liver enzyme but also we can say that coagulation factors are also increased in addition to the high level of the triglyceride and reduced level of the HDL cholesterol by and you know these two things are enough to take the patient for the cardiovascular risk in addition to the hyperglycemia as well as hyperinsulinemia together. What exactly happens into the metabolic syndrome which can really give rise to the spectrum of the diseases predicted by the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and we can see there in last slide also we have witnessed that NAFLD is characterized by the increased level of the glucose by overproduction of the glucose from the liver cells, VLDL increased level and C-reactive proteins are more as well as the coagulation factors with fibrinogen and cholesterol. And all these are the predictor of the fibrosis in the type 2 diabetic patients as with in association with the insulin resistance and ultimately it leads to the non-alcoholic hepatitis which gets converted into the liver as Dr. Jyoti Dev has said in the beginning of the talk and the patient remains on the risk of the hepatocellular carcinoma. In addition to this at the same time not only through the hyperglycemia but also in the absence of the hyperglycemia all these things are enough to take the patient for the cardiovascular risk as well as in the for, for the increasing mortality of the cardiovascular diseases. So most of the patients with NFLD are asymptomatic. 
although some patients present with NAFLD, especially those who are with the state of hepatitis, may complain with fatigue, malaise, weak right upper abdominal discomfort. But patients are more likely to come to an attention because laboratory testing are found to be having more level of the en liver enzymes, especially the aminotransferase, which we call commonly as SGPT, or hepatostatosis is detected either by the plant or incidental abdominal imaging. What are the other clinical manifestations which can lead to us for the detection of the NFLD? Hepatomegaly is one of the important things which must give, which, which is enough reason for the investigation for the hepatic infiltration of the liver. In some of the patients, hepatomegaly is the presenting sign of the NFLD, however the reported prevalence is variable. The laboratory findings which insist that we must investigate the patient further for the NAFLD are mild to moderate rise in the aspartate aminotransferase and alanine aminotransferase. Although normal level of these enzymes do not exclude the NAFLD but they are increased for without any known cause we must explore for the NAFLD. When elevated AST and ALT are typically 2 to 5 times the upper limit of the normal with an AST or ALT ratio less than 1 which is usually not seen into the alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is the difference between the alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the alcoholic fatty liver disease, the ratio between the AST and ALT, what we also known as SGPT and SGOT, are less than, uh, are in the alcoholic fatty liver disease, it is more than 2, while in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it is less than 1. So it is important differentiation what helps us in reaching to the conclusion. The degree of aminotransferase does not predict the degree of hepatic inflammation or fibrosis. The alkaline phosphatase may be increased 2-3 times after the upper limit of the normal. As I already told you in the last slide, patient with NFLD may have an elevated serum ferritin level or transferrin saturation. It is important finding which usually not seen in the routine testing. There is evidence that serum ferritin higher than 1.5 times the upper limit of the normal in patients with NAFLT is associated with a higher non-alcoholic fatty liver disease activity score. And therefore NASH which is called as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and with advanced hepatic fibrosis are get diagnosed by this. Radiographic findings are important as far as the clinical manifestations as in laboratory investigations are concerned. In patients with NAFLD, this includes increased ecogenicity on ultrasound, decreased hepatic attenuation on CT and an increased fat signals on MRI. So these are the findings which can suggest about the NAFLD. It is diagnosed on the basis of demonstration of the hepatic steatosis by the imaging or by the biopsy. Exclusion of the significant alcohol consumption is very important to reach to the final diagnosis. If it is there, we cannot think about. Exclusion of the other causes of hepatic steatosis is also important, like viral diseases too. In those undergoing the radiological evaluation, the findings are often sufficient to make the diagnosis if other causes of the hepatic steatosis have been excluded. While not indicated for the majority of the patients, a liver biopsy may be indicated if the diagnosis is not clear or to assess the degree of hepatic injury. At this point of the time, I would like to say that liver biopsy is the only thing that establishes finally the diagnosis of the NAFLD. Which patients should be taken for the biopsy? There is no clear consensus about which patient requires a liver biopsy. Obtain a liver biopsy in patient with suspected NFLD if the diagnosis is not clear after obtaining standard laboratory tests and hepatic imaging. If there is evidence of cirrhosis, if the patient wants to know if inflammation of fibrosis is present or not, the patient is at risk for advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, it is mandatory to go for the biopsy. So specifically, we should obtain a biopsy if the patient has peripheral stigmata of chronic liver disease, which, is suggest which may be suggestive of cirrhosis, patient has the splenomegaly, patient has got the cytopenia, patient has a serum ferritin level more than 1.5 times of the upper limit of normal, patient is more than 45 years of the age with associated obesity or diabetes. So, 
differential diagnoses are very big in the number and they must be excluded before tagging a patient to have the non-alcoholic liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can only be established once we exclude the diagnosis of the alcoholic liver disease, hepatitis C, Wilson's disease, lipodystrophy, starvation, parenteral nutrition deficiency, abito uh, lipoproteinemia, medications, Ray syndrome, acute fatty liver of pregnancy and HELP syndrome which is a combination of the hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet counts. Multiple therapies have been investigated for the treatment of the NAFLD. But the most important thing and what is very much required for any fatty liver disease patient or any NAFLD patient that is a lifestyle modification. It is the most beneficial so weight loss is the mandatory thing for recovery of this disease. It's the only therapy with reasonable evidence suggesting it's beneficial and safe results. Weight loss for the patients who are overweight or obese. In addition to the other benefits, it has been associated with histological improvement in patients with NAFLD2. So simply weight loss can give this much of the benefits. Options to promote weight loss include lifestyle modification or patients who are candidates for the bariatric surgery. A reasonable goal for many patients is to lose 1 to 2 pounds per week or you can say 4 to 6 kg per week, per week more rapid weight reduction may be associated with worsening, 4 to 6 kg per month, I am sorry, more rapid weight reduction may be associated with worsening of the liver disease, so it should not be more than this. Histological improvement has also been observed after the bariatric surgery. Some of the data which conflicted but when taken collectively the data suggests that bariatric surgery is having a promising results in obese patients with NAFLD. However, given the potential for worsening fibrosis in some patients following bariatric surgery patients should continue to have their liver functions monitored closely. These are the data which supports that effect of bariatric surgery are useful for the recovery from NAFLD. It has been seen that in complete resolution of the hepatitis or has been seen after the bariatric surgery procedures in some of the studies there. Although there are some of the studies which has not shown the effective results but most of the studies has been finding benefits. As far as the treatment of the type 2 diabetes is concerned like specific OAD has got a role in the improvement of the NAFLD like metformin. It is the most commonly prescribed first line oral agents in type 2 diabetes. Primary action includes decreasing hepatogluconeogenesis and net hepatic glucose production and increasing glucose uptake in skeletal muscles. It increases the insulin sensitivities and we know that insulin resistance is one of the important key reason for the NAFLD but definitely it is supposed to be increasing as, as well as the studies has also shown that metformin is not only well tolerated in NAFLD but it has it also improves the liver transaminases into the as well as histology too. The mechanism of action of the metformin that promotes increased insulin sensitivity is this which what you can say and what you can see here and as well as most of the people are knowing that it, it improves the insulin sensitivity it promotes the peripheral utilization of the glucose and it reduces the glucose absorption from the small intestine and by all these measures it improves the NAFLD. There are studies which has seen that clinical evidences are also there as far as the metformins are concerned. Metformin not only improves the imaging results but also it has been found to be improved. There are certain studies in which metformin has been found to be as good as the diet and exercise and in some of the studies are there in which the metformin has been found to be better than diet and exercise as far as the resolution of NAFLD has been seen in the histology. Another drug which has been found to be having a good results on the NAFLD progression that is thiazolidine dione. 
augmented insulin sensitivity and lead and in this way it leads to increased glucose uptake in peripheral tissues and it has been found to be having reduced glu hepatic glucose production. So in pooled analysis it has been seen that significant improvement in fibrosis as well as steatosis was seen. The so pioglitazone further showed a great decrease in fibrosis compared to the rosiglitazone or placebo in the analysis. This is the method through which pioglitazone has been found to be improving the causes which can give rise to deterioration as far as that in fact the damage to the liver cells like increase in interleukin 6, increase in TNF alpha and decrease in adiponectin. It has been seen with the various clinical studies that thiazolidine dions has shown the histological as well as imaging improvement also into the liver after being used at least for the 10 to 30 weeks and there are many studies which are to witness this glucagon like peptide GLP-1 analogs they also improve blood glucose control by enhancing glucose dependent insulin secretion they shows they slows the gastric emptying they suppresses the postprandial glucagon production they decrease the food intake through enhanced satiety so studies has demonstrated that all these things are contributory to the improvement of the NAFLD the studies demonstrated that treatment with liraglutide had a good safety profile and it has been seen significant improvement into the liver function but also histological features in the NASH patients with glucose intolerance. As far as DPP-4 inhibitors are concerned, they influence glucose hemostasis by blocking the deactivation of endogenous GLP-1 and GIP, what we all know. Several clinical studies are there with citagliptin in subjects with type 2 diabetes and NASH have shown decrease in allylene aminotransferase level and improved liver histology after the use of DPP-4 inhibitors. So hepatitis A and B vaccinations are also important for the serological evidence of immunity and they must be they must be vaccinated so that it can be ruled out they are not caused by this additional vaccines recommended for the patient with chronic liver disease include pneumococcal vaccination and standard immunization recommended for the population in general that is influenza diphtheria and tetanus boosters Treatment of the risk factors for the cardiovascular disease. Patients with NAFLD are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and often have multiple cardiovascular risk factors as we have seen in the last few slides. So management includes the not only the optimal controversial to be used in non-diabetic patient without any indication. However, it is suggested that vitamin E at a dose of the 400 international units in a day for patient with advanced fibrosis on biopsy who do not have diabetes or coronary artery disease can be given. There are certain evidences that supports a benefit with up to 800 international units a day of the vitamin E in patients without diabetes. But some observational studies suggest a possible increase in all-cause mortality with higher dose of the vitamin E that is 800 international units a day but 400 international units have been found to be safe as far as the non-diabetic patients are concerned for the treatment of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Management is very much requiring avoidance of alcohol consumption. Heavy alcohol users can never be taken for the complete resolution of the NAFLD even if it is with associated with that. Although it is very difficult to find that NAFLD is there or they are having the alcoholic fatty liver disease but there are many diabetic those who consume alcohol can never be given relief until unless they do not stop it. It is suggested that thiazolidine dions should not be used primarily for the treatment of NASH if the person is not diabetic. They can only be used if the person is diabetic. Thiazolidine dions improve the histologic parameters in patients with NASH but likely need to be used long term and their use has been associated with serious adverse events in some of the studies so it is not recommended to use only for the NASH including the heart failure. Using a thiazolidine dion 
Dion is reasonable in patients who are candidates for the thiazolidine Dion treatment for type 2 diabetes. It is only the valid indication that the use of the NAFLD progression is stopping. Patients with NASH really related cirrhosis should undergo screening for the hepatocellular carcinoma because hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common complication of the patient which are not well treated and they are suffering with the NASH. It is the most important thing when to refer to the subspecialist, when to refer to the hepatologist. Whenever we are doing a physician practice or whenever we are doing a endocrinologist practice or diabetologist practice, it is important to know that when the patient of the state of hepatitis should be referred to the hepatologist. Recommend that patient with history of hepatitis on biopsy, he should always be followed by the hepatologist in addition to be taken care with endocrinologist or diabetologist. Patient those who are non-alcoholic fatty liver without state of hepatitis can often be followed by a primary care physician provided the diagnosis is clear. However, if the patient develops significant amino transferase elevations which are more than two times of the upper limit of the normal or they are having the evidence of cirrhosis, it is suggested that a hepatologist must be taking care of this kind of the patient for the further evaluation and management. So, before I should say thank you, there is one more thing for which I would like to block your date that are 25 and 26 of the March in which we are also having one more important conference that is Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Group of the India in Lucknow 25 and 26 of the March. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and being with you. So that was the first tape of our oration and it was a very brilliant one. Uh, being an oration, uh, there are no questions. Anyway, you started with the definition, you have described the entity and you have gone through the management. But I don't uh, mind to answer any yeah, question. Yeah, it was very descriptive and uh, well done. And uh, in this part of the country, probably two to three times elevation of OTPT is of extremely common. And in my personal experience, uh, we used to give metformin, vitamin E, arsodeoxycholic acid, but three to four fold reduction in hepatic enzymes have been observed by us in our group. We have presented the American Diabetes Association and that is only with one drug and that was lyraglutide. From a value of 120 or 130, it gets reduced to around 13 to 20. In so fact, uh, two to three times uh, OTPT elevation must be excluded with the alcohol consumption. Alcohol consumption. And yeah. these patients are the candidates for imaging studies. And if you find any suspicion, then biopsy must be done before labeling a patient of the NAFLD. This must be the protocol of the diagnosis and treatment as Dr. Jyoti Dev has already suggested. Uh, treatment of the diabetes many a times it is miraculous. Lifestyle modification brings the miraculous changes in the status of the fatty liver disease may it be inflammatory or non-inflammatory and if the person is diabetic you can have lot of options but if the person is non-diabetic really the options are very much limited. Thank you. You have indirectly given a comment, it's just a joke, that alcohol consumption is very high in Kerala. <laughs> that is one of the reasons that uh, maybe 20 to 40 percent of our population has got elevated, two to three times elevation of OTPD. Yeah, Dr. Sanjay yeah. Kalra's study has shown 56.3 percent uh, prevalence of uh, NAFLD in North India. So anyway, in the morning, uh, Jayanta Panda lectured on a complication of diabetes, tuberculosis, and uh, he was showing that even Harrison doesn't have that uh, documented it, that tuberculosis is one of the important complications or comorbidity of diabetes, and this is again one of the evolving complications, and well done, Anuj.